a new pharaoh ruled over Egypt where the Israelites were living. When he saw how many Israelites there were, he became afraid of their power. He warned his people that if war came the Israelites might side with their enemies and then leave the country. So the Egyptians forced the Israelites to become their slaves. Tough slave masters made them build the cities of Pithom and Ramesses. But despite their poor treatment the Israelites grew stronger and more numerous. So the Egyptians brutally forced them to work even harder. The two midwives who helped Hebrew women deliver their babies were called Shifra and Pua. Pharaoh summoned them and ordered that if a Hebrew woman gave birth to a baby boy they must kill it. Only if the baby was a girl could they let it live. But the midwives obeyed God rather than Pharaoh and let the baby boys live. Pharaoh summoned the midwives to ask why the baby boys were not killed. The excuse they gave was that the Hebrew women were giving birth to baby boys before they had time to get to them. So Pharaoh gave orders to his people that every baby boy born to a Hebrew woman must be thrown in the river Nile. When a Hebrew man and wife from the tribe of Levi had a baby boy they hid him away from the Egyptians for three months. But as the baby grew older it became harder to keep him hidden. So his mother came up with an idea to keep her baby out of sight. She got a basket made from papyrus leaves and covered it in tar and pitch to make it waterproof. She put the baby in the basket and carried it down to the river Nile. Her young daughter Miriam helped her. She hid the basket in tall bulrushes by the side of the river. Miriam kept watch over the baby from a distance. Unexpectedly Pharaoh's daughter came down to the river to bathe. She spotted the basket and sent one of her attendants to fetch it. When she opened the basket and saw the baby was crying she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies. She said. Miriam, who had been watching, came up to the princess. Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? She asked. Yes. Replied the princess. Miriam ran to get her mother. Take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. Said the princess. So the mother looked after her child until he was old enough to be taken to the princess where he was brought up as her son. She named him Moses, meaning, drawn out. Moses grew up as a prince in Egypt. One day he watched his people, the Hebrews, being forced to work hard as slaves by the Egyptians. He was upset at the way his people were being treated. When he saw one of the Hebrews being badly treated by an Egyptian he looked around to check no one was watching then, Moses attacked the Egyptian, killing him. He buried the dead man's body in the sand. The next day he saw two Hebrews fighting and went across to stop them. Why are you hitting a fellow Hebrew? He asked. Who made you ruler over us? Came the reply. Are you going to kill us like you killed the Egyptian yesterday? Moses was afraid. People knew he had murdered an Egyptian. When Pharaoh found out, he gave orders that Moses should be killed. But Moses ran away, left the country and hid in the faraway wilderness of Midian. Moses rested by a well. The seven daughters of a local priest of Midian came to draw water from the well for their father's flock. But some shepherds arrived and pushed the woman away so they could get water for their flocks first. But Moses got up, came to their rescue and watered their flocks. When the girls returned to their father, Jethro, he asked why they were back so soon. They explained how an Egyptian had helped them. Invite him for something to eat. Jethro told his daughters. Moses was not only invited to the meal but to stay with the family. Moses agreed and later married Zipporah, one of Jethro's daughters. They had a son who Moses named Gershom. It meant, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. Some time later Pharaoh died and a new Pharaoh came to rule. The Hebrew slaves cried out to God to rescue them. God heard their cries for help and remembered his promises to his people. He had a plan to rescue them, and Moses, who was looking after sheep in the wilderness, was part of that plan. Moses was looking after the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro. He led them to the far side of the wilderness to graze, by a mountain called Horeb. He watched a bush that had caught fire and noticed it did not burn up. So Moses decided to take a closer look. Suddenly God called to him from inside the burning bush. Moses. Here I am Lord. Moses replied. God told Moses to take off his shoes for he was on holy ground. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. God announced. At this, Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. God told Moses that he had seen the suffering of the Hebrew slaves. He was going to rescue them and led them to a land of milk and honey where they would be free. Go to Pharaoh and bring my people out of Egypt. God instructed. Moses started making excuses. 
Who am I to do this? God promised to be with Moses. He also promised that he would make a way for the Hebrews to come and worship him on this mountain. But if I go to the Hebrew leaders, who shall I say sent me? Asked Moses. Tell them, I am who I am, has sent you. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. My name is forever. God instructed Moses to go to the leaders of Israel with the message God was going to rescue them from slavery and led them to the land he had promised. Moses and the leaders were then to tell Pharaoh to let the Hebrews go and worship the Lord God in the wilderness. Moses still kept making excuses. But what if they won't listen to me? He said. God asked Moses what he held in his hand. A staff. Replied Moses. Throw it to the ground. Said the Lord. When he threw his staff to the ground it became a snake. Moses was scared and jumped away from it. Reach out your hand and take the snake by the tail. Said the Lord. As Moses grabbed the snake's tail, it turned back into a staff. This sign will help them believe. Said the Jehovah God. Now put your hand inside your cloak. Moses put his hand inside his cloak but when he pulled it back out it was white with a terrible skin disease called leprosy. Now put your hand back in your cloak. God ordered. When Moses pulled his hand out from his cloak a second time his hand was healed. If the Hebrew leaders don't believe these two signs then take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. I will make the water turn to blood. The Lord told Moses. But Moses still kept making excuses. I find it hard to speak well or very clearly. Who gave people their mouths? Replied the Lord. I will help you speak and teach you what to say. But Moses still made excuses. Please send someone else to do this. God was angry with Moses. Your brother, Aaron the Levite, can speak well. He is on his way to meet you. He will be your spokesman. Take your staff in your hand so you will be able to perform miracles. So Moses returned to his father-in-law Jethro and asked his permission to return to his people in Egypt. Go, I wish you well, replied Jethro. Aaron had already been told by God to travel to meet them. Moses put his wife and sons on donkeys ready for the journey. The Egyptians, who remembered what you did and wanted revenge are now all dead. God reassured Moses. The two brothers met up at Mount Horeb, the mountain of God, and welcomed each other. Moses shared with Aaron all that God had told him. Then they all set off for Egypt to tell the Hebrew leaders that God had plans to rescue them. When Moses and Aaron arrived in Egypt they gathered together the leaders or elders of the Israelites to tell them the news that God was going to deliver them and led them to the promised land. The leaders and the people bowed down to worship God. Then Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh. The God of Israel says, Let my people go so they can worship me in the wilderness. Who is the Lord that I should obey him? Replied Pharaoh. I do not know him and I will not let his people go. If you don't obey God he may bring plagues. Warned Moses and Aaron. The same day, Pharaoh gave orders to the slave drivers to make the Hebrews work harder. They were no longer given straw to make bricks but had to collect their own straw while still making as many bricks as before. The slaves became exhausted searching for straw and making bricks. When they could not make their quota the slave drivers beat them. The Hebrew leaders complained to Moses and Aaron. May God judge you, you have made Pharaoh hate us and our lives are in danger. Moses spoke to God. Why have you brought trouble on these people? I spoke to Pharaoh in your name but you have not rescued them. God replied. My mighty hand will drive the people out of Egypt. I keep my promises. I will take you as my people and I will be your God. Moses reported this to the Hebrew leaders but they were too discouraged by their bad treatment to listen to him. God told Moses and Aaron to visit Pharaoh again. If the Hebrews won't listen to me, why should Pharaoh? Replied Moses. Especially as I can't speak very well. God told Moses that Aaron would be spokesman. He warned that Pharaoh would not listen to them but God would bring plagues on the Egyptians until they let his people go. Moses now 80 years old and Aaron who 83 was at this time, left for the palace. Pharaoh demanded that Moses and Aaron show him a miracle. Aaron threw his staff down and it became a snake. Pharaoh summoned his wise men and sorcerers. They threw down their staffs and their staffs also became snakes. But Aaron's snake swallowed up their snakes. Despite seeing the great power of God Pharaoh refused to let the Hebrew slaves go, just as God had said he would. It was now time for God to show his power by bringing plagues on the Egyptians. God told Moses and Aaron to go down to the river Nile where Pharaoh went in the morning. 
They had a message from God to give to Pharaoh, let my people go, so that they may worship me in the wilderness. Pharaoh refused, so Aaron did what God had instructed and struck the river Nile with his staff. The water was changed to blood. Fish died, the Egyptians could not drink the water and the river smelt. Pharaoh's magicians did the same thing by their secret arts. Pharaoh refused to obey God and turned and went back to the palace. Seven days later, God told Moses to tell Aaron to stretch his staff over the streams, canals and ponds to make frogs come out onto the land. Pharaoh's magicians used their secret arts and were able to do the same. Frogs were everywhere and Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron. Pray to your God to take the frogs away from my people, and I will let your people go. Promised Pharaoh. Moses replied. So you will know there is no one like Jehovah God. The frogs will leave you in your houses tomorrow. Moses prayed to God and he answered. Frogs died in the houses, courtyards and fields. The dead frogs were piled into heaps and the smell was really bad. Pharaoh, however, broke his promise and refused to let the Hebrews go and worship God in the wilderness. So God told Moses to tell Aaron to strike the dust with his staff and the dust would become gnats. Pharaoh's magicians tried but could not do this. This is the finger of God. They told Pharaoh. Gnats were on people and animals everywhere. Pharaoh still had a hard heart and refused to let the Hebrews go and worship God. Early in the morning as Pharaoh went down to the river, Moses and Aaron told him what God had planned next. Swarms of flies would buzz around the Egyptians but not the Hebrew slaves living in Goshen. Dense swarms of flies came into the palace in the houses of the Egyptians. But the flies stayed away from the Hebrew slaves. Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron. I will let you go, and offer sacrifices to your God. But you must not go far. Now pray to God to stop the flies. Moses prayed and the next day the flies left. But Pharaoh broke his promise and refused to let the Hebrew slaves go. Moses went to Pharaoh again. If you refuse to let my people go, tomorrow God will bring a terrible plague on your horses, donkeys, camels, cattle sheep and goats. But livestock of the slaves will be spared. The very next day the livestock of the Egyptians died. Pharaoh investigated and found out that the animals belonging to the Hebrew slaves were alive and well but he refused to let God's people go and worship him in the wilderness. Moses took soot from a furnace and threw it into the air in front of Pharaoh. God says, this soot will become a fine dust and people and animals will get festering boils. Pharaoh's magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils that broke out on them in the Egyptians. But Pharaoh still refused to let God's people go. God sent Moses to tell Pharaoh that he was going to show his power by sending the worst hailstorm Egypt had ever had. Anyone not sheltering inside would be risking their life. The officials of Pharaoh who feared God brought their families and animals indoors. But those who ignored God stayed outside. When Moses raised his staff the worst storm anyone had ever seen blew up. Lightning filled the skies and large hailstones came pounding down. Those caught outside were killed. But the storm did not hit the slaves living in Goshen. I have sinned. The Lord is right. Pharaoh told Moses. I will let you go. Moses went out of the city and spread out his hands to God. The thunder and hail stopped. Pharaoh however, changed his mind and stubbornly refused to let God's people go. He thought he could defy God but God was not finished with him yet. God had already sent seven plagues on the Egyptians. Moses had another warning for Pharaoh. If you refuse to let the God's people go he will bring a plague of locusts on the land. Something your parents and ancestors have never seen. Pharaoh's officials advised him to let God's people go. But when Pharaoh found out that all the Hebrew slaves would be leaving he only gave permission for the men to go and worship God. Then he ordered Moses and Aaron to get out of his presence. So Moses raised his staff over Egypt. An east wind blew all night bringing in a swarm of locusts. They covered the ground making it look black and ate everything growing in the fields until nothing green remained on plant or tree. I have sinned against God. Pharaoh told Moses. Forgive me once more and pray to God to take this deadly plague away. When Moses left Pharaoh and prayed, the wind changed direction and blew from the west, carrying the locusts into the Red Sea. Pharaoh became stubborn again, broke his promise and refused to let God's people go and worship him. Moses stretched out his hands, and total darkness came over the land for three days. Only in Goshen where the Hebrew slaves lived was their light. 
The Egyptians could not see anyone else or move about. Pharaoh summoned Moses. Go and worship God. Take your women and children as well but you must leave your animals behind. Our animals must travel with us. Insisted Moses. Some are needed to offer sacrifices to God. Get out of my sight. Ordered Pharaoh. Don't ever appear before me again. If you do, you will die. Just as you say. Replied Moses. I won't appear before you again. But God has one more plague to send. About midnight the firstborn son of every family and animal will die and there will be weeping and wailing everywhere. Except among God's people. Then your officials will come and bow and tell us to leave. After that we will leave. Moses then turned and walked out of the palace. The Lord then told Moses to tell his people that on the tenth day of the month every man who was head of a family was to sacrifice a lamb. Those who couldn't afford a lamb should join with a family that had one. The lambs must be one-year-old males without defect. God's people obeyed and each family sacrificed a lamb. God then told them to put some of the blood of the slain lamb into a basin. Then, using a bunch of hyssop dipped in the blood, they should smear the top and sides of the doorframe of the house where they were going to eat the meat. God explained that that night he was going to pass through the land to bring judgment. But if he saw blood on the doorposts of a house he would pass over and those inside would be spared. So the Hebrews did as God instructed. That evening, God's people got dressed ready to leave Egypt and sat down for a meal they would later call the Passover, for God would pass over them. Moses explained that the Passover meal was to be celebrated every year. And when children asked what it meant they were to explain its meaning and tell how God had spared those homes covered by the blood of the Lamb and set his people free. At midnight the Lord passed over the land and the firstborn son of Pharaoh and every Egyptian family was found dead. The firstborn of every animal was slain too. There was weeping and wailing in very house except those houses with blood on the doorposts. That night, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Up, leave my people and go and worship the Lord God. Take your families and animals with you. Please bless me. God's people packed their belongings. The Egyptians, afraid that they might all die, gave them gifts of silver and gold. Hurry and leave, they urged. God's people rushed off so quickly they did not have time to add yeast to the dough they had made for bread. They had been slaves for 430 years and now they were free. Just as God had promised. As soon as Pharaoh set them free, the Hebrew slaves set off in a hurry to leave Egypt. They took with them all their belonging plus the gold, silver and gifts the Egyptians had given them. God did not lead them along the coastal road towards the lands where the Philistines lived. This might have led to a battle with tough Philistines which God knew the freed slaves were not prepared for and many might have fled back to Egypt. Instead he led them into the desert by the Red Sea. During the day God led them in a pillar of cloud that always stayed in from of them and never disappeared. All night long God led them in a pillar of fire that lit up the route. Eventually God led them to the shore of the Red Sea where they camped. Meanwhile, just as God has warned Moses, Pharaoh and the Egyptians changed their minds and wanted the Hebrews back as their slaves. Pharaoh got in his chariot and gathered all his troops and six hundred chariots to chase after the escaping Hebrews. When the escaping people saw the troops approaching they cried out in fear. Have you brought us out into the desert to die? They complained to Moses. We'd rather be alive as slaves in Egypt than die in the desert. Don't be afraid, replied Moses. Stand firm and see how God is going to deliver you. The Lord is going to fight for us and you will never see the Egyptians again. Tell the people to move forward towards the Red Sea. God told Moses. Then hold your staff high and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide it so they can cross it on dry land. Moses obeyed. The freed slaves watched as the pillar of cloud that had been leading them moved between them and the chasing Egyptians. That night they were in light and the Egyptians were in darkness. God drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The people crossed through the sea with a wall of water either side of them. The Egyptians tried to chase after them but God jammed the wheels of their chariots and there was confusion among the troops. God is fighting against us. They yelled. God then told Moses to raise his hands over the sea. At daybreak the walls of waters collapsed and the dry path disappeared. The whole army of Pharaoh were swept away. No one survived. Those safely on the shore knew God had delivered them as he had promised and put their trust in him.
They also realized that Moses was God's servant and the best person to lead them. Moses and all those who had escaped sang a song about their rescue to thank God. Aaron's sister Miriam the prophet and the women, took tambourines and led everyone in dancing to celebrate. Three months after crossing the Red Sea the Israelites camped in the desert at the foot of Mount Sinai. Moses climbed up the mountain where God spoke to him. You have seen how I brought you out of Egypt. Tell the Israelites, if you obey me, out of all the nations I will make you my treasured people, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Moses climbed back down the mountain to tell the leaders of the people, elders, what God had promised. Together they responded, We will do everything the Lord has said. Moses climbed back up the mountain to give God their answer. God told Moses, I am going to come to you in a thick cloud so the people will hear me speaking to you and will trust you. Moses reported that the Israelites had said they were ready to fully obey God. Tell the people to get ready to consecrate themselves today and tomorrow. God commanded, Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day because that's when I will come down. God told Moses to put a limit around the mountain as anyone who touched it would die. Only when the ram's horn sounded a long blast could they approach the mountain. Moses gave everyone God's instructions. They washed their clothes and prepared to consecrate themselves to God. On the morning of the third day there was thunder and lightning and a thick cloud over the mountain. There was the sound of a loud trumpet blast and everyone trembled. Moses led the people to the foot of the mountain. The Lord descended onto Mount Sinai in fire. Smoke billowed up like a furnace and the whole mountain shook. The sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. God called Moses to come to the top of the mountain. Warn everyone to stay outside the limits around the mountain and set it apart as holy. God told Moses. Then return to the top of the mountain with Aaron. Moses went down to warn everyone that the mountain was holy and they must not approach any closer. Then he and Aaron climbed back to the top. God then gave his laws for living to please him. I am Jehovah thy God, who brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Says the American Standard Version. You shall have no other gods before me. Don't make anything to be worshipped or bow down and worship anything but the Lord God. Don't misuse the name of your God. You are to work for six days but the seventh day is a rest day set apart for God. Respect your father and mother so you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not tell lies. You shall not envy after anything belonging to someone else. The people below remained at a safe distance trembling with fear. God gave Moses more instructions to help them live at peace with him and each other Moses wrote down God's laws and then told everyone what God had commanded. We, we will, will do, do everything, everything the Lord, the Lord has, has said. said. They all replied. The next morning Moses built an altar to God at the foot of the mountain. Young bulls were sacrificed and half of their blood was splashed on the altar with the rest put in bowls. Moses then read God's laws to everyone again. We will do everything the Lord has said, they promised. Moses then sprinkled the blood on them and said, This is the blood of the agreement or covenant, what God has made with us. Moses then led the leaders up the mountain where they saw God but he spared their lives. Under God's feet was something that looked like a pavement of bright blue marble. The leaders ate and drank on the mountain. God then asked Moses to come to the top of the mountain on his own where he would write his commands on tablets of stone. Joshua, who had led the Israelites into battle, accompanied Moses halfway up Mount Sinai where he waited for him to return. The cloud covered the mountain for six days and then on the seventh God called to Moses. He went into the cloud where he stayed for forty days and nights. Moses was on Mount Sinai for forty days and nights and the people below wondered if he would ever come back. They came to Aaron and demanded. We don't know what has happened to Moses. Let us make gods to lead us. Aaron told them to take off the gold earrings the women and children were wearing and give them to him so they could be melted down to make an idol. The gold was melted down and shaped into a golden calf. The people responded by declaring. These are our gods who brought us up out of Egypt. Tomorrow there will be a festival. Declared Aaron. Early the next day. People sacrificed burnt offerings, ate, drank and started a wild, noisy party worshipping the golden calf. Meanwhile, Moses, who was still high on Mount Sinai, was instructed by God. Go down immediately. The people I brought out of Egypt have become rotten. 
They have made an idol cast in the shape of a calf and are bowing down and offering sacrifices. They are saying, these are our gods who brought us out of Egypt. God was so upset by their disobedience he told Moses he wanted to destroy them. Moses pleaded with God not to destroy the people he had rescued from Egypt. He knew God had promised to make them into a great nation. Moses took hold of the two stones on which God had engraved his commandments and started walking down the mountain. Halfway down Moses met Joshua who had been waiting for him. It sounds like there is a war in the camp, said Joshua. It is not the sound of victory or defeat, replied Moses. It is the sound of singing. When Moses saw the people wildly dancing to the golden calf he was angry. He threw the two stone tablets to the ground at the foot of the mountain, breaking them into pieces. Moses took the calf the people had made and burned it in the fire. Then he ground it to powder, scattered it on the water and made the Israelites drink it. Moses turned on Aaron. What did these people do to you, that you led them into such great disobedience? When they saw you were gone a long time they wanted gods to lead them, protested Aaron. I put gold in the fire and out came this calf. Moses stood at the entrance to the camp and said, Whoever is for the Lord, come to me. Those in a tribe called the Levites rallied to him. Moses told them to get their swords and carry out God's punishment on those who had disobeyed him. The Levites carried out the order. Moses then told them, As you have shown your loyalty to God he has chosen you to serve him. Moses called the rest of the people together. You have committed a great sin, but I will go up and talk with God. Moses climbed back up the mountain to ask God to forgive his people for their disobedience. God told Moses that those who had worshipped the golden calf would be punished with a plague but the rest would be led on to the land God had promised to give them. God told Moses to chisel two new tablets of stone and return to the mountain again. The Lord then wrote on these tablets what he had written before, the Ten Commandments. Moses came back down the mountain and put the tablets in the Ark of the Covenant. When Moses was on Mount Sinai God gave him instructions to build a place where he could live among them. It was to be called a tabernacle, made of materials that could be packed up and moved as they traveled through the wilderness. Expensive metals, fine wood, leather, rich cloths, dyed threads, wood and precious stones would be needed to make the tabernacle. The Egyptians had given the Hebrew slaves expensive gifts when they left Egypt but would they be prepared to give a share of these to God? When he came down the mountain Moses told everyone. God wants those who are willing to bring their gifts to build a tabernacle. We need precious metals and stones, strong acacia wood, linen and cloth. We also need skilled workers. Every morning people willingly came and gave their gifts to make the tabernacle. They brought jewelry and objects made of gold, silver and bronze, ram skins, leather and acacia wood. People were happy to give fine linen, goat hair and expensive threads in blue, purple and scarlet. Others gave olive oil, spices and precious stones. God had told Moses that Bezalel and Oholiab, two fine craftsmen, should be put in charge of the work. They were filled with the Spirit of God to be good in all the skills they needed to design artistically with metals, wood and other materials. Other skilled workers joined them to make everything that God required. Every morning people kept coming to bring their gifts. Soon they had more than they needed and Moses told them to stop giving. In God's plan there was to be a large courtyard. 150 feet by 75 feet, or 46 meters by 23 meters. There were 20 posts down the longer sides and 10 down the shorter sides each made of wood with a bronze base, silver hooks and silver top. Finely twisted linen curtains were made to go between these posts. The entrance of the tabernacle was always to be pitched facing east. Curtains of finely embroidered blue, purple and scarlet yarn and finely twisted linen were made for the entrance. Inside the courtyard the tabernacle would stand. Which size was 45 feet by 15 feet, or 13.5 meters by 4.5 meters. A strong wood frame was built and four covers to go over it were made. First, there was fine embroidered linen, then a layer of goat's hair, over that was a layer of ram skins dyed red. On top was a cover made of a bluish animal skin, possibly dugong. Tabernacle was to be divided into two rooms separated by a thick veil of fine linen embroidered with figures of angels in blue, purple and scarlet. Only priests would be allowed to enter the holy place. No one would be allowed behind the veil into the most holy place, holy of holies, apart from the high priest. 
he would enter it once a year to bring the blood of a sacrificed animal to make peace with God for their sins. The only object made to go inside the most holy place was an ark made of acacia wood covered in gold. The cover, mercy seat, was made of pure gold with two cherubim facing each other whose wings met and spread over the cover. It was over this cover the very presence of God would be. Golden poles and a cover were made for the priests to lift and move the ark on their travels. A table made of acacia wood covered in gold was made for the holy place. It too had golden poles to carry it. It had plates, dishes and bowls all made of gold. Placed on the table each week were twelve loaves of bread representing the twelve tribes of Israel. A lampstand with seven branches made of pure gold was made to light up the holy place. A third bit of furniture for the holy place was a golden altar. Priests would use this to burn incense, stacti, onica, galbanum and frankincense, every morning and evening to make a pleasing aroma to God. So that the priests could wash their hands and feet before they served God in the tabernacle a large bronze wash basin was made. It was to be placed in the courtyard in front of the holy place. A square altar of acacia wood covered with bronze was made to go in the courtyard. At each corner was a bronze horn and it had golden carrying handles. The altar would be used for people to bring a male animal without defect, cattle, sheep, goats, or birds if they were poor. They would put their hand on the animal to show it was being offered for them to make peace with God. The animal would be sacrificed and its blood sprinkled on the altar. This shed blood made it possible for God to forgive them for the wrong things they had done. The animal would then be burnt on the altar. Garments for the priests were made of white linen. A special garment was made for the high priest, Aaron. It had a blue sleeveless tunic. Bells of pure gold were sewn around the hem with woven pomegranates between them. When the high priest went into the most holy place those outside could hear the bells as he moved around and know he was still alive. Over the robe a richly embroidered ephod of gold, blue, purple and scarlet was worn. It was made in two pieces joined together at the shoulders with golden clasps. Each clasp was set with an engraved onyx stone. On his head the high priest wore a turban made of fine linen which was bound around the head in coils. On the front of the turban on Aaron's forehead, attached by a blue lace ribbon, was a golden plate engraved, Holy to the Lord. A special breastplate was made for the high priest. It had twelve precious stones each one engraved with the name of one of the twelve tribes of Israel. When everything was ready the tabernacle was built in the middle of the camp with three tribes on every side. The tabernacle furniture was put in position. Moses placed the two tablets of stone containing God's laws into the ark and put the cover over it. When everything was finished, and Aaron and his sons had washed and put on their robes, the glory of God filled the tabernacle. The cloud of God was over it by day and the fire of God every night. When the cloud lifted the Israelites would dismantle the tabernacle and travel on through the wilderness. They would make camp and assemble it again. God's presence remained with them wherever they were. The pillar of cloud led the people from the Red Sea into the desert of Shur. They traveled for three days without finding any fresh water. Then, when they came to a place with water, it was bitter and undrinkable. They named it Mara, the Hebrew word for bitter. The thirsty crowd grumbled angrily to Moses. What are we going to drink? Moses cried out to God for help. The Lord showed him a piece of wood and Moses threw it into the water. Immediately the water became fit to drink. If you listen and obey God, he will keep you from any diseases he brought on the Egyptians. He is the Lord who heals you, said Moses. The people then traveled on through the desert to an oasis called Elam where they found twelve springs of water and seventy palm trees. Here they camped by the water and rested. They then set off from Elam towards Mount Sinai through the desert of Sin. In the desert they became very hungry and started grumbling to Moses and Aaron. In Egypt we had plenty of food, you have brought us out into the desert to die of starvation. The Lord told Moses, I am going to rain down bread from heaven for six days each week. On the sixth day people should gather twice as much. On the seventh day there will be no bread from heaven as it is a special day for them to rest. Moses and Aaron announced. God has heard your grumbling and is sending meat this evening and all the bread you need in the morning. Then you will know that he is the Lord who provides. Who are we? You grumbling is not against us but God. Aaron told the crowd to come before God. As they looked toward the desert they saw the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. 
The Lord promised Moses he was sending meat that evening and bread in the morning. That evening a large flock of birds called quail landed near the camp. The hungry people caught them and ate the delicious meat. The next morning there was a layer of dew on the ground which dried up and became like thin flakes of frost on the ground. What is it? They asked Moses. The Hebrew word for, what is it, is, manna. This is the bread from heaven. What God promised, everyone should gather as much as they need. Don't collect more than you need and store it overnight. Moses explained. And everyone started gathering the manna. It was white like coriander seed and tasted like wafers made with honey. Moses explained they were to gather just enough for five days. Only the sixth day they were to gather twice more than they needed as there would be no manna on the seventh day. Most people obeyed God and gathered enough food for that day. Some however were greedy, disobeyed God, gathered more than they needed and stored it overnight. The next morning it was full of maggots and smelt horrible. On the sixth day most people gathered twice as much as God had told them. On the seventh day the extra manna was still fresh and they could eat it. Some however went out looking for manna but there was none. God has declared the seventh day as a special day of rest. Everyone is to stay where they are in rest. Warned Moses. The Israelites traveled on towards Mount Sinai. They were to eat manna every day for the forty years they were wandering in the wilderness. When they camped at Rephidim there was no water to drink. They complained and quarreled with Moses demanding. Give us water to drink. Moses cried out to God for help. What am I to do with these people? They are ready to stone me. Go out to the people and take the leaders, elders, with you to the rock at Horeb, carry your staff with you and strike the rock. God replied. The leaders followed Moses to the rock at Horeb and watched as he struck it with his staff. Water burst out of the rock, just as God had promised. Everyone drank the water. Moses called the place, Massa and Meribar, because people had doubted God by asking, Is the Lord with us or not? In Hebrew, Massa means, testing, and Meribar means, quarreling. God had kept his promise and provided food and water in the desert. A group of desert nomads, known as the Amalekites, came up behind the traveling Israelites and started attacking the weak and elderly people traveling at the back of the convoy. Moses told a young, tough leader called Joshua to choose some strong fighting men to go out and fight the Amalekites the following day. The next day they set off. Moses told them he would stand on top of a hill with a staff of God held high in his hands. Moses, along with Aaron and a leader called Hur, went to the top of a hill to call on God's power in the battle. Moses held his hands up. While Moses's hands were held high, Joshua and his men began winning the battle. But as Moses got tired and lowered his hands, the enemy started winning. As Moses became exhausted, Aaron and Hur sat him on a large stone and helped him keep his hands high. They supported him all through the day until sundown. Joshua and his men fought victoriously all through the day as Moses's hands were kept high. That evening the battle was finally won. God told Moses to write something on a scroll that Joshua and the people could read and be reminded of later. I will completely defeat the Amalekites so that they will no longer exist. Moses built an altar and called it, The Lord is my banner. Then he declared, As the Amalekites attacked us, the Lord will be at war with them from now on. With their enemies defeated, God led his people to the foot of Mount Sinai where they set up camp. Moses had married, and Moses' sister, Miriam and his brother Aaron, the high priest, were not happy and began to mutter and complain about Moses. Has the Lord spoken only through Moses? They asked. Hasn't he also spoken through us? The Lord heard their complaining. Now Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else living at that time. The Lord said to Moses, Aaron and Miriam. Come out to the tent of meeting, all three of you. All three of them did so. Then the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud which stood at the entrance to the tent. The Lord then summoned Aaron and Miriam to step forward. They obeyed. The Lord then said, I reveal myself to prophets in dreams and visions, but I speak face to face with Moses. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? The Lord was angry with them both. When the cloud lifted from above the tent, Miriam's skin was leprous, it was as white as snow. When Aaron saw that Miriam had a defiling skin disease, he pleaded with Moses. Please, my Lord, don't hold this sin against us. Don't let Miriam have flesh that looks half eaten away. So Moses cried out to the Lord. Please my God, heal her. The Lord replied. 
confine her outside the camp for seven days in disgrace, after that she can be brought back. So Miriam was expelled outside the camp for seven days. When she returned, her skin was clean and she was welcomed back into the camp and her family. After leaving Egypt, the freed Hebrew slaves moved through the wilderness on their way to the land God had promised them. As they approached Canaan, they stopped in the wilderness of Zin at a place called Kadesh Barnea. The Lord told Moses to select a leader from each of the twelve tribes to go and spy out the land ahead. Moses chose a leader from each tribe. Their names were Shamua, Saphat, Caleb, Igal, Joshua, Palti, Gadiel, Gadi, Amiel, Sether, Nabi and Gul. Moses told them to find out whether the people in Canaan were strong or weak. How big were their towns and were they fortified? Was the soil fertile or poor? He also asked them to bring back some fruit from the land. The twelve spies set out from Kadesh Barnea through the Negev desert, where the Amalekites lived, then up into the hill country. They saw very tall and strong people who were descendants of Anak. They moved north through the hill country where the Hittites, Jebusites and Amorites lived and then around the river Jordan and Lake Galilee where they saw Canaanites. The towns and cities were large and well fortified. They went as far north as Rehob before turning back and retracing their steps. When they reached the valley of Eshkel, they cut off a branch bearing a single cluster of grapes. Two of them carried it on a pole between them, along with some pomegranates and figs. After forty days, they returned to their camp. They reported, The land does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are large and fortified. One of the spies, Caleb, silenced everyone and said, We should go up and take the land, for we can certainly do it. Ten of the spies disagreed. We can't attack these people, they are stronger than us. All the people we saw are huge. Compared to them we seemed like grasshoppers. That night the Israelites grumbled and wept. They complained to Moses and Aaron. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to die in battle? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. They started planning to choose another leader and go back to Egypt. Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of everyone. Two of the spies, Joshua and Caleb, stood up and said, the land we explored is exceedingly good. The Lord will lead us into that land flowing with milk and honey, and give it to us. Don't rebel against God or be afraid. The Lord is with us not them. Just as those listening were muttering about stoning Joshua and Caleb, the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting. The Lord told Moses, How long will these people refuse to believe in me, in spite of all the miracles I have performed among them? I will strike them down with a plague and destroy them, but I will make you into a stronger nation. God told Moses he would punish their rebellion by keeping them in the wilderness for forty years, one year for each day the spies had been in Canaan. The ten spies who brought a bad report died of a plague. Only Joshua and Caleb survived, the spies who trusted in God to keep his promises and give them the land. The rebellious people then changed their minds and decided to attack the Amalekites just north of their camp. Moses said, Why are you disobeying the Lord's command? This will not succeed. But they went ahead. The Amalekites, helped by the Canaanites from the hill country, came down and attacked them and beat them into a swift retreat. For the next forty years the Israelites wandered around in the wilderness. All those who rebelled against God died. A new generation grew up willing to trust God and take the land God had promised to them, under the leadership of Joshua, supported by Caleb. Moses addressed the people. I am now 120 years old and unable to lead you. God has told me I will not cross the river Jordan and enter the promised land. But the Lord will lead you to overcome the nations living in the promised land. Be strong. Be courageous. Do not be afraid. For the Lord your God will be with you. He will not fail or let you down. Moses then summoned Joshua and in front of everyone said, Be strong. Be courageous, for you will lead these people into the promised land. See to it that they conquer it. Don't be afraid, for the Lord will be with you and go before you. He will never fail you or forsake you. Moses then wrote out the laws he had given the people and gave them to the priests to look after. He told them to read them to everyone every seven years when they gathered at the festival of tabernacles. Moses called everyone together to hear God's laws read aloud. He urged them to do what God wanted and obey him with reverence. 
God then summoned Moses and Joshua to meet him in the tabernacle. He appeared to them both in a great cloud at the tabernacle entrance. God told Moses that he would die. He also revealed that once the people of Israel had conquered the promised land they would disobey him and worship foreign gods. So, God then asked Moses to write down the words of a song which would remind them of the foolishness of disobedience and its consequences. Moses wrote down the lyrics of the song and then recited it to the people to learn. The words of this song are recorded in Deuteronomy chapter 32. Not only did it warn them of the difficulties they would face if they acted stupidly and disobeyed God but it reminded them of God's love and forgiveness if they returned to him. The song exalted the power of God and how he would bring them victory. That same day the Lord told Moses, Go to Mount Nebo in the land of Moab across from Jericho. Look out across the land of promised land of Canaan. After you see the land, you must die. That is because you rebelled against my instructions to order water to come out of the rock at the springs of Meribah Kadesh. You will see the land I am giving the people of Israel, but you will not enter it. Moses climbed from the plains of Moab to Pisgah Peak in Mount Nebo, across from Jericho. God pointed out to Moses places in the promised land including the Jordan Valley and Jericho. The Lord explained. This is the land I promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that I would give to their descendants. Now you have seen it, but you will not enter it. So Moses died in the land of Moab as the Lord had said. The Lord buried him in a valley near Beth Peor in Moab, but no one knows the exact place. Moses was 120 years old when he died, yet his eyesight was perfect and he was as strong as a young man. The people of Israel mourned for Moses for 30 days on the plains of Moab. There has never been another prophet like Moses, for the Lord talked to him face to face. Joshua was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands upon him. He was now their leader and the people of Israel obeyed him in the Lord. God told Joshua, You are the new leader of Israel. Led my people across the Jordan River into the promised land. It extends from the Negev Desert in the south to the Lebanon Mountains in the north, and from the Mediterranean Sea in the west to the Euphrates River in the east, including all the land of the Hittites. I will be with you just as I was with Moses. I will not abandon you or fail to help you. Be strong and courageous. Obey every law Moses gave you and you will be successful in everything you do. Remind the people about these laws, and think about them every day and night. Be bold and strong. Banish fear and doubt. For remember, the Lord your God is with you wherever you go.